This is sacred turf. The holiest of the holies for those who participate in the sport of kings. Yes, we're in Newmarket for a day or three at the races. And we're making a wild punt that there'll be some pretty serious archaeology lying somewhere underneath this venerable old town. We're going to be looking for the remains of the very earliest days of horse racing because this is the place where the whole shebang got started. And the earliest dedicated horse racing facilities in Britain could still lie buried somewhere beneath Newmarket. Excuse me. So what odds will you give me on us finding the first racing stables in the world? We'll give you four to one that you've got earth anything. Fours? Yeah. Well, some bets you just can't lose, can you? It's early morning, day one in Newmarket. Our dig site's a couple of miles away from the racecourse in the town's historic heart. We'll be looking for a royal palace and some stables that could be pivotal to the story of horse racing. And already the archaeologists are making one hell of a racket. Time team's Jackie McKinley's behind all this frenzied activity. She's our regular bones expert and is running this week's dig. Ian! Can you cut the digger for a minute? Jackie, why are we hammering away at the tarmac already? Well, we've got to get through this in order to be able to get at this building underneath, this stables building. Now, if you look across there, you'll see the remnants of Charles II's palace that he built after the Restoration. And what we have here is a, a map that was done in the 1740s showing Charles's palace but over here, this massive building on this side is the site of his stables. What we're hoping is that this will still be surviving underneath the tarmac for us to be able to get here. at. Yeah. It comes all the way across to here. It's a massive, massive building. And you can see how big it is just in relation to the building across the road. This is a palace for horses. Yeah, it is almost literally as big as the palace, isn't it? Yeah. You have to remember how important horses were at this time. Imagine a footballer with his garage full of classic cars and Ferraris and Porsches. That's what these horses represented. Prestige, status, they're beautiful and they're built for speed. The one problem we are going to have is whether we can tell whether this was just a racing stables or whether it was just an ordinary stable. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. What we need for that is the tack, the equipment that would have gone with the racing horse, which was slightly different to the ordinary riding horse, and that's going to give us the clue. And if we can secure that evidence, then we've really hit the jackpot. This would be the first dedicated racing stables in the world. The courtyard may look decrepit now, but it was once the focus of Royal Newmarket. The small town's position in the rolling Suffolk countryside, a fast day's ride from London, has made it a convenient rural hideaway for centuries of royals. They were drawn here for a range of country pursuits, but above all, for horse racing. And to this day, Newmarket remains one of the global centres of the sport. In fact, it's completely horse-obsessed. It's already home to the National Horse Racing Museum, and on our dig site, they'll soon be erecting a huge new complex to house the collection. So this is the last chance to dig here. We're relying on the geophysics to give us an idea of what's below the ash felt in the stable yard. Jack is hoping the radar will pick up some of the features on her 18th century map, enabling her to position her trenches with laser-guided accuracy. But archaeology is rarely that straightforward. Okay. So, John, what, do, what does all this mean? It just looks like a lot of lines to me. Yeah, well, these are the radar plots, and right. all these lines, certainly in the top metre, appear to be service pipes of right. one sort or another. As you go deeper into the ground, though, we're getting one or two linear responses that could be more interesting. Now, this one in particular, that is on the line of your wall for the stable block. Yeah. But the right angle we've got in the radar doesn't match the end of the building at all. Yeah. It's actually eight metres away. So clearly there's something we quite don't understand. This series of blobs on John's geophys results will almost certainly be worth investigating. 
But we've still got to pick a location for the first trench. So what's the plan of campaign then, Jackie? Well, I'm still inclined to go for what I was originally going to do, which is to put something like a 5 by 2 initial 5 by 2 over where we think the entrance is. If we can find that entrance way, we can work out from it, because it's a known point. So we're wasting no time in getting stuck in. Phil's trench is going in over where we hope the entrance way lies. It's a good, identifiable target. And just as expected, it's not long before there's a sniff of archaeology. What have we got here then, Phil? Oh, well, it looks like there's a, a simple wall or summit in here, but it's been cut away by this service. service trench that comes through here. Right. But it's quite high up, isn't well, it? Well, yes, I know it is, but it's still a wall. I don't know what it relates to, or how old it is, but it's, it's a wall. Well, it's a start, isn't it? Well, absolutely. OK, jolly good. It's too early to know whether this wall is part of a 17th century stables, but Phil certainly got the bit between his teeth. And while the archaeologists push on, Mary Ann's beginning her historical investigations into the origins of Newmarket. John, Newmarket was such a sleepy little backwater for so long, and then mm. James I comes along mm. and essentially transforms it. Yes. How did that come about? Uh, well, James first came to Newmarket in um, February 1605 and he stopped here to course hares. And he was very impressed with the local topography, in particular the heath. And he decided this would make excellent terrain for his many sporting um, activities. James I wasn't a particularly good rider. He was never renowned for his horsemanship. No, he had thin, spindly legs and, you know, he looked rather un unprepossessing in the saddle. But Charles II was a real keen horseman. He was horseman. a superb horseman. And he raced in the horse races himself. Yes, I think he won a race in 1671. Although one does wonder whether um, his courtiers were tactful in letting him win sometimes. But, you know, even so, you know, the king was a great horseman, 100% horseman. So from these humble but noble beginnings grow the sport and the industry that we've got now, the sixth largest in the UK. Yes, yes and it transformed Newmarket from a, a mere wood-hot hamlet to the metropolis of the turf. Back in the courtyard, Phil's been making good progress. It's a really sticky, muggy afternoon, lots of flying ants around, that kind of thing, and we're all pretty sweaty. But the archaeology looks like it's been pretty successful, doesn't it, Jackie? It's brilliant. I mean, we, for once, we've managed to put the trench exactly where we wanted it. <laughs> it's over the entranceway, the front entranceway into the stables. So we've got the main south wall here, we've got a turn in there, what's with one side of the corridor, and then the wall continuing the other side. But the interesting thing is that the, the construction of this wall, because you can see you've got this light grey material behind, which is the clunch, the chalk, which is forming the inside of the wall, and then on the outside, you've got the brick. So the clunch is this stuff here, Richard, yeah? Yes. yes. It's yeah. basically chalk, and well, it's got a brick frontage. Yeah. And it's quite posh brick as well. You feel that? It weighs a tonne. That Quality is... brick. It's a serious brick. <laughs> it's a serious So what brick. sort of date would you give to that? I would put them late 17th, quite happily. If Richard's intuition is correct, then we're probably on to a building dating from the time of Charles II. So it looks like a good start to our three-day archaeological steeplechase. And perhaps our historic documents hunt can help us edge even further ahead of the pack. Around the corner from the yard, tucked into Newmarket's High Street, is the current site of the National Horse Racing Museum. Museum director Chris Garibaldi is showing Marianne around this treasure trove of equine-related gems. Chris, this archive is bursting. <laughs> We've got some interesting stuff. I mean, one of the most important things relating to what we're doing with the dig is um, a copy of John Evelyn's diaries from the 1670s, where he describes coming to Newmarket. We went to see the stables and fine horses, of which many were here kept at a vast expense, with all the art and tenderness imaginable. This echoes this idea that these horses are incredibly prized possessions and... Absolutely. And ..invested the, in. The, the, the building itself would have had high status. It's a major building that appears on the plans, uh, when you compare it to the palace itself. Do we have dates for when these stables were built? Yes, we think that they were built in 1671 with the rest of the palace, but there is some um, indication 
that they may have been earlier, they may have been rebuilds. And if that were to be true, it means that they're not 1670s, they're right the way back to pre-Civil War structures from the 1620s, which would be hugely exciting. It's not very likely, but it's a possibility. And whether these stables were simply the stables of the king or whether they were special stables for his racehorses. Yes, there's, there's an entry in the archive that relates to payments made to um, craftsmen for work done for the king in Newmarket. And this is a, a copy of the king's accounts? Yes. Henry Blow's carpenter for work done in and about the king's stables where the running horses stand mm -hmm. and at the ice well etc etc at Newmarket. So that specifically tells us that these were running horses, race horses and not just any old stables. So the documents are suggesting we may well have a dedicated racing stables but only the archaeology can determine this for sure. We've had a fantastic day here in Phil's Trench where we seem to have found some early stables which, if the dating of the bricks is right, could be 17th century. But that's only part of the site. Over here, thank you very much guys, is where King Charles II had his palace. Not a bad place, is it, Richard? It's not bad. It's a yeah, genuine bit of late 17th century palace. What more do you want? Would it have looked just like this? Well, no, it's only a fragment, and it's also been quite heavily restored recently, so it's nice to get to the nuts and bolts of it, really. Do you think we'll have a chance to find more? Well, I hope so, because it's not every day you get the chance to, to excavate in a 17th century palace, is it? According to the plan, in this courtyard area here, we have a whole range of buildings here, which, I mean, it's not clear what they were. There may have been uh, offices, there may have been the kitchen areas. So we, we could have a look at those. Do you foresee any problems here? Um, only the impending problems that John hasn't got any geophysics <laughs> and there will be undoubtedly a mass of services. But going on what we've had in here, it really has paid up Trump. So I see no reason at all why we shouldn't have a 17th century palace here. Yeah, we mustn't be defeatist, must we? You've shown impressive form on day one, but can you keep up? The pace. Ah. Will you be able to find King Charles's holiday home, or will we be flogging a dead horse? Oh, oh, no. What? Oh, what? Oh, get what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Beginning of day two here at Newmarket, and we've already come down on some very nice 17th century royal stables. But this morning, I've climbed the little hill above the town to check out the gallops, where for centuries, stable lads have brought their horses every morning to give them their exercise. This area of open heathland lies conveniently close to the town. Thanks to its chalky soils, it's the ideal surface for training horses. It's one reason why Newmarket became the home of British horse racing. Royal patronage was the other key factor. From Charles II's reign onwards, racing gradually evolved into something like the organised sport that we'd recognise today. Charles's imposing Newmarket Palace shows the scale of his commitment to the town. The portion that survives is impressive enough, but it's only a fraction of the huge structure that once stood here. In the 17th century, it would have extended right down to the high street, covering an area of several thousand square feet. This was a full-scale grand royal palace. And our archaeologists are eager to find some of the missing rooms, hopefully still buried beneath this gravel car park. I mean, guess what? Mm. Services. Uh, and not a lot else. No. I mean, this you can see the radar plot with the, the buildings on top. Yeah. We're not really seeing much at all. Now, I'm just wondering whether below these chippings there's a sort of makeup that we're not seeing through. Yeah. Mm. You know, that might explain the results or it's been totally trashed. Because this was a really, really busy area. I mean, if we, if we look at this, this is, this is the, the, the plan of the palace. That's the mansion house building we've got there. The green bit is where the current courtyard is, where the gravel is. And these are believed to have been state offices, that kind of thing. Whereabouts do you want to actually put the trench there? Right, well, OK, if we go back to the palace building, what I think we're going to do is put a small trench over 
that cross wall because it's it is a cross wall we'd be able to orientate ourselves there so <laughs> you've basically given me a trench that possibly may be trashed made ground no geophysics and later phasing of building great yes but you and like the a challenge don't you you like a challenge right <laughs> show it'll be good for you But Rakshar's trench soon proves to be even more of a challenge than any of us could have foreseen. Before long, she's onto a serious layer of concrete. Ian can't seem to smash his way through with the mechanical digger, so we need to find another solution. I think the only thing we can do is, is get some tools or something, try and make a hole in it so we can get underneath it, pick it up. I mean, maybe a road iron and a, a, a pickaxe, something like that. And I don't think that my ears could take much more scraping yeah, on that concrete. Surprise. Ooh, OK, let's do that, cos... Yeah. Um... Let's get some tools. <laughs> <laughs> While our two stoical archaeologists prepare to hammer through the concrete, I've been summoned to the horse racing museum for a so-called important experiment. What's all this, then? This is Alfie. He Hi, is Alfie. racing royalty. He's had a lifetime in racing and he's an ex-jockey. With a race named after him. At least I can get in it. It's a bit it's, of a stretch. It's but... quite impressive. How, how much do you have to weigh to be a jockey, Alfie? You can weigh, weigh what weight you like, as long as you can do the weight that the horse is set to carry. All mine used to carry seven stones, so... Could I race off uh, ten and a half stone? You could do, but you'd be carrying a bit of overweight on the flat. You'd be all right over the jumps, but not on the flat. We'll find you a nice solid mount. OK. Like that one over there. This? Oh, you are joking. You'll be what hot is... to trot. What is this, Alfie? <laughs> This is legless, but um, I assure you, you won't fall off him and, and put that leg on there. Just throw your other yeah. leg over. Okay. Why don't I put my foot in the stirrup? Because only cowboys do that. <laughs> I'm going to set him off now, OK? I can't wait. OK. Hands tightly down, stand yeah. up, stand up, crouch forward. Now, I'm going to go on a stride. You're doing perfect at the moment. Don't lose it now. Don't lose it. Hands tightly down. Yeah. Keep looking straight between his ear holes. I'm going on a stride. Yeah. You're doing great. You're doing great. Oh, OK? It's knackering, isn't it? How's your lunch? You've only walked out the yard. You <laughs> haven't been anywhere yet. Okay? How does it feel? Oh, it's heavy. Oh, that's a killer. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, wow, me nuts! Oh. <laughs> it's so knackering. <laughs> You've got another four races to do today. Uh, well, I think that's the nearest you're ever going to get to seeing me ride professionally. Whew. Four miles, five heats. That's what King Charles used to do. It may have been painful, but at least this exercise has given me a bit of an insight into why professional jockeys came into being. It takes serious skill. And it's this story of the professionalisation of the sport that we're hoping will become apparent in Phil's Trench. If all goes to plan, we'll soon be able to identify this structure as a dedicated racing stables. Phil, I'm all right walking on here, innit? Yeah, anywhere in here, Tony. This trench now looks twice as big and three times as complicated. Uh, it's absolutely spot on. Everything we could have hoped for, Tony. And it is exactly as the plans show us. The nice thing about it is, of course, we actually see what the plans are showing. If we look at, look at it like that, there's our entranceway. And it shows that we come in through a main corridor and that at the back end of the stalls, you come into a flight of stairs. This is the flight of stairs. And, and this brick flooring may well be the, the, the underfloor cupboard, if you like. Hang on, so, so where are the stairs themselves? Where the, would they the, be? Stairs, the stairs are probably going to start here, yeah. and they're going to walk up here, up here, up here to a landing, turn, and then you would carry on up probably to the, the storerooms above. Yeah, yeah. And then in here, we actually are at the back of the stalls. And you can actually see us, uh, get a sense of that, because in here, where Tracy was actually digging, she, sa she said it felt very, very organic. It felt like wood. Probably, we're actually looking at the shuttering at the back of the stalls. And so where you and I are, we would have the, the King's Pro Stallion and the Pro's Mare, eating their oats, preparing for the next great event. The stairs are an important clue. Unlike most stable stairways, they've got a turn in them. 
This is an unusual and rather fine feature, suggesting the upper floor was quite grand, rather more than the usual hayloft. It indicates a very smart building, but it's not yet decisive evidence of a racing stables. Now, what we do know is that we should be able to pick up the wall that divided the front half of the stables from the back half of the stables. And what I'm wanting to do is extend the trench that way a little bit so we can see the stalls on both sides and see if there's any difference between them in the flooring or anything else, which may give us more of a clue to what's going on. It's possible that only one half of the stables was dedicated to racehorses. So we may find some differences between the two halves that will demonstrate this, but the odds are long, and have we got the stamina? You sure that we're not going to start biting off more than we can chew? It is quite a complex trench It already, is quite it? complex, but I think, you know, we can G things along a little bit and <laughs> maybe speed things up from a, a trot to a canter, maybe? He's ignoring me completely. What are you saying? I was <laughs> concentrating on my archaeology. Don't worry, he's, he's deaf as a post. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon of day two in Newmarket, and the archaeologists have really got their work cut out. The mercury is rising, and they're building up a sweat in this asphalt covered heat trap of a stables yard. As you can see, already this trench is pretty big, and just before lunch, Jackie said she wanted to extend it and open up a little bit here, which, as you can see, she has done. But not only that, she's extended to here, 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 and right the way to here. Jackie, this is trench madness. <laughs> no, it's not quite as bad as it looks, really. Remember when we decided where to put the trench? And what we did was we looked at the 1740s plan and we also looked at the GFIs and they didn't quite agree with each other. Now we've found that the 1740s plan is correct, we need to work out what this mysterious blob is. So is your thinking that that blob probably isn't the same phase, the same date as the stuff we've already found, so yeah. it could be earlier, and it could be much earlier than Charles II. Exactly. We need to extend the trench at that end in order to be able to investigate that. What are these funny things here? What those funny little things are there are the big posts that would have stood at the end of the individual stalls. Yeah. And when I say large, I mean, you know, we're talking about something that would have been that big, that could hold a post that a large horse could go up behind and sort of rub its bottom up against when it had an itch. <laughs> So there's a very full afternoon's work ahead of us and no shade for a weary archaeologist to shelter from the full heat of the sun. Alex and Richard, meanwhile, think they could now be on the trail of the earliest royal remains in Newmarket. According to our historic documents, Charles II's grandfather, James I, built his palace just off the present-day High Street. Alex is hoping that fragments of it may still be visible. Or is this just an excuse to visit Newmarket's toy shop? You want to see something really old? Take a look at that. Well, all right, we're not going back quite as far as the Jurassic, but you are looking for something that's earlier than Charles II's palace, aren't you? Well, we are. We know that James I had a palace here, yeah. and according to this map, it should be somewhere on this spot, believe it or not. So, uh, excuse me, um, we're looking for a palace wall. Could you give me directions to the back of the shop? Right, if you'd like to speak to Jason. Yeah. Just through there? Yeah. OK, great stuff, chaps. Make your yeah. way through. This way? OK. okay. Yeah. Here we are, lads. Oh, well, that's definitely old, isn't it? It's old, well, It's yes. older than the front, anyway. Well, it looks it. <laughs> yeah, it's a very nice bit of brickwork, but I'm afraid I don't think it's... Jacobean Palace. Why do you say that? You've got things like these round arched headed windows, brick mouldings, the bricks are fairly large as well. Right. So... You're not convinced? I'm not convinced, You want no. to take a closer look? I want to take a closer look, yeah. I mean, my, my eyes are drawn here. Oh, right. Certainly the lower courses here, because these bricks are very much thinner, aren't they, than the bricks that we, certainly that we've got up there? Yes, you're certainly right there. So thinner bricks, earlier period, is that possible? It's possible, and it's really a question of whether this is the remnant of the plinth of an earlier building, or whether they're just reusing right. bricks 
low down in the plinth. Alex, I think you're being slightly desperate. And <laughs> Richard is clearly saying this is not a very old building. <laughs> I'm clutching at straws. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Release the straw yeah. and, and let's admit that we had a lovely time in the toy shop. It was some very interesting toys. It was nice. But it's not that old. On balance, the toy shop building seems to date from the early 1700s, at least 70 years after the time of James I. So it seems our trenches remain the best bet for gaining a glimpse into Newmarket's royal past. But in Rakshar's palace trench, the going's not been good. We've been looking for walls from a demolished section of Charles II's palace, but they're still proving elusive. Hi, Raksha. Oh, you've had a really hard time being here, <laughs> haven't you? <laughs> but you do seem to have walls here. Well, we do. Um, so we have a wall coming through there and something here which is probably a floor or a wall. But this trench has been really trashed around. When we placed this, it was supposed to be over a T-junction on the 17th century palace building, but these walls both appear to be going in that direction. There's no T. They do. They don't really match the plans that we looked they at don't. earlier. And no dating evidence, presumably, so far? No, not, not yet. Obviously, nothing in situ, even right. if we did find anything. So I think the best thing that we have to do is give it a really good clean, see where this is going. Is it a wall? Is it a floor? Mm. Don't know. And then hopefully we'll be able to give you a much sought after dating evidence that you need. Right, and decide which <laughs> direction we need to go in order yeah. to find out where we are. <laughs> OK, I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> Given the lack of datable finds from Rakshar's trench, we're going to have a second stab elsewhere in the palace grounds. We're going into the gardens, Morning, where an intriguing feature showed up on the Geophys. Jimmy's got some nice results from here. I mean, we've got this curving feature. Mm. Now, I'm just wondering whether it's a sort of pond. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that's worthwhile having a look at, don't you? Go on, dig it, find I'll get, it. I'll mark it out <laughs> now. Where do you want it, then, Jack? Are you... Well, if that's, yeah, somewhere about here, I reckon, starting about here and, and then going... coming straight out this yeah, way? Yeah, about a metre. So metre the... in, two metres out. OK, so... So we've now got a definite target in the Royal yeah, Back but, Garden. And, and... Potentially, it's another direct connection to the new market of Charles II. And, with a bit of luck, we may even get some high-status, datable finds out of here. Jackie's next port of call is the Horse Racing Museum. As a bones specialist and a horse lover, she can't resist the opportunity to learn more about racehorse skeletons while here in Newmarket. And this is the skeleton of one of the greatest thoroughbreds that ever lived. Isn't this a wonderful skeleton? It's beautifully formed. No, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's, it's Hyperion, who's a 1933 Derby winner, but he's also an incredibly important sire horse because he sired a number of very important winners um, after his racing career himself mm. finished. But what we were hoping is that what you might be able to tell us from the bones. Oh, right. well, the first thing to do is always check that you've got what you <laughs> think you should have. That and it is a horse. Well, right? that it is a male <laughs> horse because it's got, it's got a can canine teeth, which are much smaller in females, are absent altogether, I believe. But of course, one of the ways you can tell you have a racehorse is really because really they have these really quite chiselled faces, comparatively speaking. So, you know, he's got quite a, a sharp angle to his jaw that's quite narrow. And, and this, this area here, which is, you'll be pleased to know, is called zygomatic arch, but basically it's a bit beyond the eyes, yeah. um, is really quite narrow as well. So you've got this fine chiselled face. But even though he's small, he's obviously been a very powerful yeah. creature. If you look at the muscle attachments on his back legs, particularly here, they're really big. And he's also got strong muscle attachments on his forelimbs, on his, on his radii, which are here. And unlike often with humans who have very powerful muscle attachments, they are equal on both sides. So he's obviously very well balanced. Yes, it's that sort of compact body shape. Mm. And people often remark on how small he is relatively to what they imagine a big racehorse would be. Yeah. But it's all about lean agility at this stage. Yeah. So maybe small, but perfectly formed. Absolutely. The skeleton shows us just how distinctive the physical attributes of a racehorse are. The question is, have we found anything in the trenches to show an equally distinctive racing stables? Hi. Well, we seem to have a somewhat meagre but hopefully informative collection of finds here. It's only meagre down his end. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Size isn't everything. 
Um, well, pottery front is a bit meagre. Um, we've got one piece of pottery, which is this. This is probably late 16th into 17th mm. century, and it's probably a drinking cup, but that's the only bit of pot we've got that's oh, round about that date. Right. Isn't that weird? Because I can match that with one single metal fine from the 17th century. It's a button, but it's quite a big, quite nice yeah. button. Yeah. I mean, this is all domestic waste. There's nothing here I could say came from a horse stable mm. with any confidence. It's the problem of distinguishing when you do have finds of whether they were used on buildings or whether they were used on horses. It's, yeah. You'd think you'd be able to tell the two. Now, that looks ever so much like a hoof pick, mm. particularly when you're thinking about how nicely it fits in the hand. But then when you hold it like that, it also does look ever so much like a door catch yep. or a gate catch. And, of course, you need loads of those in stables. Uh -huh. In fact, you need them anywhere. And it's the same with, with these things. Because at first, when these were found, somebody said, oh, that looks like a thing that's known as a manger bob or a hitching weight, that you, you tie it to a, to a rope that then goes up through a ring and to the horse's head collar. So when it's in a loose box, it can move around. It's got almost like a stretchy rope, because this comes up and down, holding the loop taut, the yeah. rope taut, so that it doesn't get tangled. I don't know what you think of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very heavy. I think the poor old horse would have trouble moving his head anywhere with that. No, I think, I think you're right, and, and I think Actually, the true answer is probably, again, they're connected with doors or gates, therefore automatically closing them. Yeah. You can open them, you let them go, this full pulls down on a chain or a rope and it shuts it. So, so again, not necessarily horses, buildings. And having said it was quite clean, why have we got a dead rat on the table? <laughs> well, it's a stable, isn't it? It's a miracle, there's only one. <laughs> with the end of day fast approaching, Perhaps Phil's trench will have produced structural finds that can tell us more about the stable's function. Cassie's been working on the extension at the back end, where she's been looking for stalls. Well, Cassie, this has come on a long way. Last time I saw this, all, you, all it was, was was machined. What have you done? Well, it's cleaned up as, as well as rubble with, trench, with um, service trenches cut through it cleans up. We've got um, later bricks sitting on these really shallow plinths of more, more than mortar, and there really isn't an awful lot of stable going on back here. Well, that is a disappointment. I mean, one of the reasons we extended into this, this area was actually to see whether we could get any evidence of the stalls in the stable, and yeah. particularly the spacings of them, to see whether or not they were similar to what we got over there. We haven't got it here, but no. fortunately, my evidence is a lot better. Oh, yours is very yeah, steady. Yeah, come and have a look at this. Because, you see, you've got that wall over there. Yeah. And then we've got this slot here. Now, according to the mapping and the measurements, that's 1.9 metres wide. I wouldn't say horse wide, but anyway, that's <laughs> 1.9 metres wide. Now, we've extended this way, and look what we've got here. A groove oh. with red bricks in it. And... What do you reckon the spacings are between those two grooves? Could it possibly be 1.9? A bang on the money, absolutely. So, I mean, it really, really is good because now we can, we can reconstruct the design of the stable completely along this side of the stable. We know that we've confirmed that all the spacings for all the stalls are 1.9 metres. So in Phil's section of the trench, there's irrefutable evidence of horse stalls. They're exactly the dimensions we'd expect, and there's clearly a whole row of them running the length of the trench. It's a good place to be at the end of day two. So where should we start tomorrow? Well, I mean, obviously, we've got to finish cleaning this up. We've got to finish cleaning this up. Then I've got to get all that spoil moved, because underneath there is our geophysical anomaly that might indicate a building here earlier than the stable. We're finally ready to dig the anomaly that showed up on John's initial geophys survey right back on day one. With 24 hours to go, could this hold the key to explaining the stable's function, or are we veering wildly off course? Beginning of day three here in Newmarket, and behind me is all that's left of King Charles II's palace, so we're putting in a trench over there to see if we can find any more of it. Meanwhile, on this side of the road, our trench just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We're over King Charles's stables, although whether it was a stable just for his hacks or whether it was a racing stables, we haven't yet managed to ascertain. Hopefully, by the end of the day, we'll find something diagnostic, because there's an awful lot of metal finds starting to come up. 
Having said all that, Phil, there's a heck of a lot of archaeology here, isn't there? There is a heck of a lot of archaeology, and there's, there's a list of things that we still feel are unresolved. Firstly, we don't want to forget that we, we've got this area over here, although a lot of that has been trashed when they put this building up here, but there is still a chance we might be able to trace some idea of King Charles, the layout of his stalls. So we want to do something in there. Secondly, we don't want to give up our, our search for the, for the look of these posts that Jackie so ably described their, their, their young use of yesterday. Where the horses exactly, scratch their yes. bottoms, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we still want to look at those, so we will clean up and really, really look into there. Thirdly, you can see that we've actually started to strip out the last quarter of the trench. That is to try and find that, that, that geophysical blob thing that they, that they find. Well, normally I'd say to you, remember, we've only got one day left, but it's far less than that, because you and I are going to the races this afternoon, aren't we? We are? We certainly are, so you better get moving. Oh, gee up. <laughs> Matt certainly not been hanging back in his trench in the palace gardens, but has he yet got any dating evidence? Oh, I've basically talked to Helen. What we're looking for is bits of iron with holes in it. Bits of bits. Loops. Yeah. Well, there you go. I just wonder if it's worth giving yeah. a shout on the comms. Yeah, we'll do. Hi, Helen. Uh, we've got something which we think might be a bit of a bit. So if you've got five minutes, if you want to turn over, I'm in trench four. I'll be over. Okay. Well, it's got an hole in it, so... What were you saying Ah, the, the very person we're looking for. I couldn't you know, actually hear. You know, you said what we're really looking for is bits of iron with holes in. Yes. Well, this may be just nothing, but we have a bit of iron with a hole in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is lovely, and it undoubtedly does have a hole in it, but I don't think it's anything horse-related. Oh, okay. what it's What it's saying to me, actually, is it's, it's, um, it's to make a bucket out of something wooden, if you see what I mean. Oh, it's a handle mount it's for a bucket. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. It's, it's not saying horse, you see, because it's all too kind of flat and big okay. for a horse. Okay. I mean, I'll go and check, but I think what you've got there, lads, is an old bucket. Oh, well. OK. <laughs> and around the other side of the palace in Rakshar's trench, we've been hoping for great things. Mind you, we always joke that Rakshar gets the... <laughs> Lousiest trench of all. How have you done? Do you know what? I'm absolutely overjoyed. Go on. Because, you know, we've been battling for a couple of days through this concrete and really hard gravel and sand and all these massive services running through everything. Yeah. And that there, believe it or not, is the palace. That's the palace? That's the palace. Have we any idea what bit of the palace that might be? Yes, I do. <laughs> so exciting. So, our trench is here. Yeah over this T-junction, yeah, and we actually have that. So this is the T running in that direction, and yeah. this is going across. And can you see this gap just there? Yeah. Lo and behold, gap in the trench. It is a bit of a triumph, given that we were so despondent about finding anything yesterday. Well, I'm pretty pleased. Well, well done, you. <laughs> The two palace trenches have added to our understanding of the royal complex and confirmed that the historic plans were accurate. Alex and Richard are still pondering the much broader picture of 17th century Newmarket. They're investigating the route of the town's racetrack at that time. Could this give us any further clue to the function of our stables? Alex? Yep. You've taken me away from a nice 17th century palace. I have indeed. You've brought me out in the middle of nowhere and it's about to rain. Yes. <laughs> what are we doing here? Well, we've got this fantastic account from Cosimo de' Medici. He was a Duke of Tuscany in 1669. By invite to, uh, of the king, he came here to watch one of the races and he right. describes in great detail the race. Now, I presume that this race is the Duke's course. And let's say it is, because it's a four-mile course and that's what mm -hmm. the Medi Medici tells us. Now, it was started on this side of the dike. Mm -hmm. It will have been two-horse race. The king and his retinue were stationed at King's Gap. Okay. Right. So the race starts up, they start up quite slowly and then start to work the horses up. They then would have come through Running Gap at the very far end of the dike. They would have come on to Rowley Mile. That's this part of the course here that we see that runs into the main grandstand. Now at this point, Medici tells us that the king and his retinue would have then started riding with the race. Okay, so right. two horse Joining race, yeah. they would have been geeing up the other riders and they would have followed them all the way in, essentially to the grandstand, not where it is today, but right on the edge of Newmarket Town. So not far from the palace? So not far from the palace at all. 
So the old racetrack ran much closer to Charles's palace and our stables than the present day track. It's another piece of evidence suggesting the stables were built for racehorses. At the end of the race, what happens is uh, the king wraps himself in his cloak and retires immediately to his palace. That sounds like a great idea <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I think it does. <laughs> now, you didn't have a cloak to wrap yourself in, so I think we should head back immediately. OK, let's go. Alex and Richard are taking cover just in the nick of time. After two days of glorious sunshine, the great British summer behaves in the usual manner. Unleashing a sudden downpour. It's the last thing our archaeologists need in their immaculately clean trenches. Oh, look at that over there. Look, look, it's like the Niagara Falls. Look at it. It's terrible. It's all negative. All negative. It's, it was looking so good. And then, look, like, only in a few minutes. Look at it. Phil, should I stick a bucket load of muck to stop that from flowing in? Well, that ain't going to make a muscle of difference, uh, Ed. That water's just going in there. It's only good for frogs at the minute. Luckily, it turns out to be a passing shower. So the archaeologists are soon back at work, sponging up rainwater. Oh, no. That rain didn't do you a lot of good, did I it? I tell you what, it looks a lot better now than it did about, I don't know, a quarter of an hour ago. <laughs> it was a swimming pool. But it, it is. Now the sun's coming out and we've got the mops on and, and I think we're, we're, we're back to work again. Good. That's <laughs> a big wall. You've spotted that. That is the blob that appeared on John's geophysics. Yeah. And it was the it was the wall that we were wondering, was it an earlier phase of wall? It didn't yeah. tie in with anything yeah. else. Now yeah. we've exposed it, you can see just how big it really, really is. We've got it coming through there, we can trace it. There it is there. Ah, butting up against Absolutely. this cross wall as well. I mean, the thing of it is, though, what on earth is it? Well, let's hope that this rain holds off, because otherwise you're going to be in a pond again. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, the going is not good to firm. Yes, yes, a bit soft, yeah. It may finally be uncovered, but our mystery blob is still something of a mystery. We've now got less than half a day to work out whether or not it's part of a much earlier building. At least the sun's shining again, just as well as it's time for us to pay our quick visit to the racetrack. Today isn't just any old day at the GG's, but one of the highlights of the racing calendar, Newmarket's Ladies' Day. Some of us are keen to have a flutter, but we're determined to find an archaeologically linked horse. We have found a connection. Number seven is owned by Sir Evelyn de Rothschild, who was actually brought up at Palace House, where we're doing the dig. Right. Oh, right. So, if that's not a reason to back it, what is? That is a connection, <laughs> isn't it? it? Is yeah. So John's off to wager some hard-earned florins on Crystal Capella. Will his geophysical abilities give him an edge, an insight into running conditions on the track? They're off. They raced away, and I'm sorry, it was just wearing a little bit of... It appears not, as his favoured filly struggles at the back. Crystal Capella is just ahead of my place later, who's the back marker. But then, just as all seems lost, Crystal Capella comes surging through. Right to the front of the pack. Crystal Capella and Ryan Moore have taken it up now and have gone two, three, four, that's clear. So it's Crystal Capella who sees it approaching the final furlong and has gone... And Crystal Capella romps home. John. Oh, oh, thank you. Congratulations oh, from all of us on your great win. So by some miracle, our wager has paid off. Can the same be said for our archaeological efforts back on site? Cheers. Cheers. Sadly, we never found evidence of the large posts that Jackie was hoping for. But what about the mysterious wall section, the geophys anomaly that's had us scratching our heads since day one? This is the mysterious John Geoffrey's blob, isn't it? It is indeed. That is a foundation wall. It's the same width as the foundation wall for the south, south wall that we're standing on and for the cross wall at the top. So it's not what we hoped for, a pre-Cromwellian wall? No, no, not at all. So I think what's happened is they got the foundations in, the architect arrived or the king himself, and they looked at it and thought, 
No, guys, this just is not going to work. We'll go for the outline of the building. Oh, it's below ground level. Let's just leave it. And you think that's a plausible explanation? I think it's the only reasonable explanation for what we can see here. The geophys blob wasn't older than the rest of the stables, as it abuts the other walls. It's a foundation wall that was never built on. There was a matching wall on the other side of the stairway, so the stable block would have had a symmetry to its design, until somebody changed their mind. What about the other big question that you've been asking, really, since the beginning of day one? Was this just a stables for the King's Hacks, or could it have been a high-class racing stable? We have a massive stable building. They're stabling for 24 horses here, which is a lot of horses. We have a very grand structure. So the, the archaeology and the architecture that we can see that we have here answers for us, I think, that question. It is, I think, fairly conclusive that this would have been where the king would have kept his race horses, his favourite horses. He could see them from his garden when they were walking around in the yard. It's got to have been where he had them. So our gigantic royal stables truly were a palace for horses. This was an impressive structure, far more grand than most of the houses in Newmarket at the time. This magnificent building was almost certainly the first dedicated racing stables anywhere in the world. But there's only one way to really understand the layout of this place. Let's call in the stable lads. Fortunately, we have one of the famous new market horses, which is going to come in and show you how it works. So what we're doing is we're coming in through the main entrance. I'm glad John's got that bucket in case there's an accident. <laughs> You're then going to turn in and come in through one of the doors into this eastern block. And he might be a little bit frisky because he's sort of going backwards and forwards a little bit, being a bit difficult. They're leading him up into his stall. They fasten him up and he has a jolly good feed and possibly a poo. <laughs> Phil, I didn't realise you were so good with animals. I know, I was born to be a horse lover, wasn't I? <laughs> so cool.